Hi, I'm John the Engineer Turmel, candidate for the Popper Party in the Sudbury Provincial by-election now going on. Last night was held the Chamber of Commerce big debate with all the candidates, not like last week's corruption by Jim uh, Thompson at the CBC where he excluded everybody but the big guys. Here everybody was invited, so it was a lot more fun. I got to go. Uh, but here's the report by Sudbury Star Prostitute Mary Catherine Keown. The article's final debate. Lively, at times fiery, in front of a huge crowd. And uh, her comment was, with all ten candidates participating in the debate, it was fiery at times. Hmm. There were shouting matches and verbal bouts as well as a few tedious disruptions and nonsensical contributions of certain fringe candidates. Well, do tell. What? Oh, well, she doesn't bother. Just take her opinion as gospel, okay? She thinks that the fringe candidates were nonsensical and she's not going to bother proving her point. So anyway, prostitute speaks. I'll have more fun with her when I do the highlights of the video with just me instead of me and all the boring guys too and I'll finish up what I think are her at the end of that video. Same title as this one except they'll have highlights in the title. Well, my name is Johnny Molodet of the People's Political Party. I love Sudbury. I love Canada. I'm sure all of our professional politicians say this. We all know that the politicians at the at the federal, provincial, and municipal levels have become spokespersons and lobbyists for the enterprises. We know that the tax exemptions in the form of tax cuts, tax credits, tax allocation, tax subsidies, and tax avoidance passed by the professional politicians in the legislature via omnibus bills have aided the top 1% in becoming the multinationals, multi-billion dollar corporations. How? In the form of government subsidies as a matter of course. We all heard the expression, too big to fail. Our leaders in the, of the past 30 years have fallen for this line time and time again. No matter what, the three sitting parties in the legislature have undeniably have taken their eyes off the ball. The people no longer benefit from the tax system as it was originally intended. Canada has, since joining NAFTA in 1992, become a corporate welfare state. Social programs for, Ontario, uh, for the people reduced, health care for the people reduced, education for the people reduced, transportation for the people reduced, infrastructure and community housing for the people reduced, in some cases, to near non-existence. Who is responsible for this? I like to call it libertarian capitalist politicians. Thank you, Monsieur Odette. Monsieur Olivier. Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you to the Chamber for organizing this debate this evening. My name is Andrew Olivier, and I am the independent candidate in this Sudbury by-election. I was born and raised here in Sudbury to a family of French and Italian background. I have an honors Bachelor of Commerce degree and a Master's in Business Administration, both from our own Laurentian University. I'm a business consultant that helps small business with startup and grant proposals, and also help in operating my family's business here in Sudbury. I'm an accessibility consultant that helps guide organizations, private and public, and to adhere to the laws set out by the Ontario Accessibility Act. For the last eight years, I've worked in healthcare as a sitting member of a nonprofit home care service provider by the name of ICANN. And I've spent 20 years volunteering to help advocate for people with disabilities. As an independent MPP, I will bring the issues of suburbians to Kings Park and not the other way around. I will have the same speaking rights as every other member in the legislature. I can and will produce private members' bills that will advocate for the people of Sudbury in our riding and what Sudburyans need and want. I won't be influenced by party politics or agendas set out by party leaders. How many times have we seen politicians change their position 
on an issue would betray the trust of their constituents just because their party leaders didn't agree. That is why, if I'm voted in as an independent, I will remain made as an independent. It is time for Sudbury to have a voice and an MPP they can trust who will be there for them at every turn and who will truly vote in the favor for what is good for their community and keep Sudbury strong. I believe it is time to get our voice back. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you, Mr. Olivier and Ms. Peroni. Good evening, everyone, and thank you all for being here. Uh, it shows that, city that this city cares. Uh, clearly, that you are here this evening to be informed, and I, I truly appreciate your time here, and thank you to the Chamber as well. Um, I use this next minute and a bit to tell you just a little bit about myself on a personal level. I'm a wife of 26 years and a mom to two fabulous boys. Uh, I've been a school board trustee since 1997, and I guess that was my jump into politics at the municipal level. And I've enjoyed every bit of it. Education is my passion, and I truly believe that we need to educate uh, healthy, happy children, uh, and eventually we will be, have healthy, happy seniors. As a school board trustee, I was the, uh, the pres president of the Provincial Association for two years, so that afforded me the opportunity to spend about two and a half years at Queen's Park. Uh, I know my way around, and when you elect me as your MPP, I will be able to hit the ground running for sure. Um, after that, I became the president of the Catholic Trustees at the federal level and spent two years in Parliament Hill, and that again uh, just added more of a passion for politics to my blood, and I truly <coughs> believe that uh, going forward, I will make a spectacular MPP on your behalf. As some of you may know, I'm not a wallflower. So, Sudbury's voices will be heard loud and clear uh, at Queen's Park, I can assure you of that. Um, while being a trustee, we, we don't do it for the money, we do it for about $5,000 a year, so that was certainly not the, uh, the motivation. Um, I enjoy what I'm doing, I enjoy representing Siberians, I have enjoyed being out over this last three and a half years campaigning, listening to what you want, what you need, and I am absolutely the person to give you what you deserve, and you deserve the very finest. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ms. Peroni, Mr. Picanzi. The way I see the role of an elected representative is twofold. First of all, it's the responsibility of the elected representatives to speak to the issues of the day or the policy of the day coming from the government and speak to them in the best interest of the constituents of Sudbury. That could be anywhere from infrastructure, which we sadly need or definitely need uh, increased funding for. That's uh, taxation. Uh, taxation is a burden that uh, not many people are uh, in favor of accepting any more of. So it's a distribution or redistribution of the taxation. Then there's a revenue source for Sudbury. And uh, there's a multitude of idea ideas that come through, and I'm um, limited by time constraints here of going through them all. The second role of the MPP is to represent the interests of Sudburyans in the administration of government, not just in the legislature, but how and why the needs of any one of the constituents come up and they're dealing with government agencies or government administration and they get the cold shoulder or they get shied off and uh, with all due respect to the chamber when there's a business concern and they lose touch with the chamber then they have no recourse that's what the role of the mvp is for is to keep a road of recourse open constantly and consistently for all constituents business owners homeowners um, welfare recipients, whoever. And that is a major role for, uh, for uh, a representative. And sadly, too many of them are failing on that. And we need somebody. I, I'm going to ask you to try and imagine the day that I'm elected, how they're going to fall over themselves in Toronto. Thank you, Mr. McConsey. Uh, Mr. Pedeski. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming from sin-ridden earth into your very presence and glory. Your name is above every name. Your name is Jesus, the 
lamb slain from the foundation of the world, but not for the world, only for your chosen bride, your remnant, thy church. Thank you for choosing the people to perfect against the majority of vile people on earth. Thank you for your indwelling Holy Spirit that convicts of sin and of your righteousness and of the judgment you bore on behalf of your people. Thank you for the forcefulness of your love that judges to repentance. We come before you with all sorts of false standards, Father, for we have wandered terribly from your word. We have established a new precedence of evil in our province in electing a leader of abominable sexual perversion in your sight. We pray, Father, that you judge her to repentance or destroy her and her claim. Oh, come on. Mr. Petr Petsky, you're going to have to be careful with your uh, uh, comments or we're going to shut off the mic. I think God's word should be put before your personal uh, religion. I'll just finish my prayer if you don't know. Uh, your time is up, Mr. Popescu. Thank you, uh, Dr. Robinson. Please, the talk you hear. Can I ask before I start, how many of you have read any of the 150-odd columns I've written about Northern Ontario and its economy? Quite a few, eh? <laughs> well, then you know that for the last 10, 15 years, I've been a pretty serious champion of increased autonomy for Northern Ontario, devolution of power to people in Northern Ontario. You'll know that I've talked about how Adam Smith said, no community, no colony succeeds unless it has control of its own destiny. The issue that's hidden behind a lot of what's going on in this election is that Northern Ontario is still a colony. And the people that we send to Queen's Park are going to be fighting against that. They're going to be fighting against, for instance, a premier who has said, I don't want to support any form of regional government in Northern Ontario because then the Northerners might want to secede from the province. Okay, well that's kind of like saying, I want to keep sucking the resources out of the North and not let the people govern themselves. So I like to suggest, I'll come back to my other favorite issue when I get the chance later, but the underlying issue, the really deep issue in every election we have, and I want you to ask all the other candidates about this if you get a chance, is what are you going to do to get us some power over our destiny? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Uh, Good evening. I'm honored to be here with you this evening. I've worked my whole life in Sudbury as a community builder and as an entrepreneur. As your MPP, I will bring a lifetime of skills and experience to serving you. Sudbury is known for our rich underground resources, but I believe our true strength lies in our natural resources that are above ground, and it's our people. As the owner of a small business and in my recent work with TEDx Nickel City, youth innovation, and the local film and television industry that continues to grow here in Sudbury, and in my role on the board for Cambrian College, I have seen the creativity, talent, and innovations we have here in Sudbury. As a chair for the Ontario Trillion Foundation, its grant review team for Northeastern Ontario, and through my experience with FEDNAR, I know firsthand the important impact that can be made in our communities by a little bit of government support. Unfortunately, after 10 years of broken promises, the Liberals are still failing to separate. For 10 years, they've promised the same things over and over again. For 10 years, they've let us down and taken us for granted. And now, the Toronto Liberals have brought their scandals to our own city. But this is nothing new for them. 
Let me read you a quote from 2009. The Liberals have come to our city, but true to form, they are focused on partisan interests rather than real issues. You know who said that? It was Glenn Tebow himself. And now, he's joined up with the Toronto Liberals telling us that we just have to accept their style of backward politics. But it doesn't have to be this way. Sudbury deserves better. And that's what this election is all about. The election is about making sure Sudbury has a new, strong, and principled voice. I will be that voice, and I look forward to earning your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blanchett and Mr. Tebow. Thank you, Jeff. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming out this evening. It truly is a great uh, privilege to see so many people out here this evening. Some of you from far away, so welcome to Sudbury. We are going to be debating the issues tonight, which I think is something fantastic for all of us. As we've been going door to door, and I know all of us have been going door to door, we're hearing right from the grassroots, from the people, and what the issues are for us here in Sudbury. And we know that the issues are different here in Sudbury. It's not the same as the Toronto-Hamilton corridor. We have different needs when it comes to health care, to infrastructure. Our winters are colder. Many of us know that over the last few days when it's been minus 38 and we've been going door to door. And so what? We need to ensure that we get the services that we need up here in the north. And that's why I am running for the Liberal Party. To be our voice in government. To make sure that if it's a PET scanner, if it's Mailey Drive, if it's completing the 400, we need those services here for us in the north. And I'm going to make sure that I'm that voice at Queen's Park. And I'll be that voice each and every day like I did for the last six and a half years. Thank you very much. I'm John, the engineer, Turmel, and this is my 85th election. I'm in the Guinness Book of Records, same page as Her Majesty the Queen. Didn't go to my head because in the American version they put me on the same page as the world's biggest bagel. So why do I do it? Why do I keep running? Well, I'll pay my tax for army and police to handle strife. I'll pay my tax for doctors, nurses who protect my life. I'll pay my tax for all engaged, repairing road and sewer. Oh, by the way, the reporters call this shouting. I'll pay my tax for social servants helping out the poor. I'll even pay my tax for bureaucrats with no regret. I only object to paying tax for interest on debt. Now, matter of fact, this was me being arrested, picketing the IMF World Bank. Immorality of interest led me out to police station in 1981. 30 years before the Occupy people figured out who were the bad guys. I was out there alone. Well, the solution to our problem was done in Argentina. Look for Argentine solution. When the banks went bust and the government couldn't pay, the union said, no layoffs. We'll take small denomination provincial bonds in our pay if we can use them for hydro taxes, medical and licenses, so everybody else will take them too. Alternate currency, rather than none. No layoffs, maximum employment. Within five years, all foreign debt paid off. So, same thing when I ran for Mayor Branford. I wanted to pay people with bus tickets, kids, to shovel the snow. And they were all going to do it. So, last but not least, they have a lot of fun. Super loser fails again, was the headline in the Hamilton election 1996. But Let's is the software that does the interest-free banking. And one month after that, I said, anyone can do it. The Hamilton self-help group started up a Hamilton Let's. Mr. Thank, thank you, Mr. Termel, uh, Mr. Waddell. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. My name is James Waddell. I'm another independent candidate from Sudbury for the by-election to be held on February the 5th. Uh, it's all about the weather. Uh, when you're a northerner and you come from the mining capital of the world and you have the opportunity of a significant by-election, it's always about the weather and Toronto stepping in and seeing how they can manage things for us. 
and they go back to the old ways and they draw up old promises. Promises from 40 years ago about a four-lane highway. With the financial predicament that they've placed themselves in, they will have a difficult time promising Angora goat farms and worm ranching this time. I don't know if anyone can recall that from 40 years ago. Those were the sort of promises that came from a central government in Toronto as what our solutions would be. And the message has changed, and it's tone deaf for the North, a very tone deaf message. I, I'm glad to see Mr. Thibault back here again out of the cocoon. It's nice to see a professional campaign that can pivot on a dime, professional workers out there, etc. Again, it's something, it's something to marvel at. More importantly, though, the tone deafness is the launching of the Thibault, which I saw as the Titanic, lurching left to right, gas powered, etc., heavily laden with a hydro debt yet not hydropowers. I saw us being coached on financial literacy at an elementary school with the Premier up front and centre telling us that financial literacy should start at an early time. Yeah, I, I agree with all those things. I, I, I've attempted not to let the media uh, define my candidacy. I don't think I'm a, a radical. I don't think I'm defiant at Thank all. you, Mr. Woodell. I'm asking questions. Thank you. The Northerners wish to ask. Thank you, everyone, for your introductory remarks. I think the audience has now heard everything. I'll now uh, call on tonight's panelists to begin the question period. And for the first question, Ms. Nutt. The cost of servicing this debt is $10.6 billion in interest per year. Interest on debt is the fourth highest expense in the province. If elected, what specific steps will you take to eliminate the deficit and pay down the debt while protecting core services that Ontarians, Ontarians value? All right. Uh, thank you, Ms. Nutt. We'll call on the candidates in a random order to respond to this question. Somewhat random. The chamber staff has dictated the random order to me, which is very helpful. The first person to respond will be uh, Dr. Robinson. The debt has been largely a, a product of the depression of the Ontario economy as a result of high oil prices and the shift, the um, high dollar as a result. Now, a lot of that's going to come back, so some of that discussion has almost gone away. So what do you do for about a third of that? Because as I say, the deficit is going to decline automatically fairly quickly over the next four years. The truth is you're going to have to raise some taxes. You have to pay for the services you want, and we can't get around that. You business people know that. You pay for what you get. I know you want to say you can't, and you won't. I'll tell you what's going to happen, though. One of the, you're going to get some hidden taxes snuck in under the Liberal government if it continues. They plan to sneak in hidden taxes using a cap and trade system, unlike the proposal that the Green Party's made, which is to actually just collect some of the money that goes out of the province for carbon and give it back to people. That doesn't actually solve the debt problem, although it does boost the economy a good deal. The version that they're coming up with is going to actually be a hidden tax grab. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Uh, the next uh, response will be from uh, Mr. Thibault. Thank you. Um, it is very important that we ensure that we balance the budget, and that's the plan of uh, this government by 2017-2018. But we have to ensure that we meet the target in a way that is fiscally responsible and fair, but you have to be prudent at the same time with the spending. And so we've been doing that um, over the last six months, making sure that spending has a watchful eye. Um, looking at the Ed Clark report and taking that seriously. But at the same time, we can't do what we've seen at the federal level, which is where you're just cutting and cutting and cutting, which the Conservatives have done, and we've seen that done in the past in the province, because we need to protect the services that the public rely on. And that is one of the things that is paramount um, for the Liberal government. 
We continue to move forward, we'll continue to balance the budget, and we'll make sure that we protect all of the services that people rely on in this province. Here in Sunbridge, we are all aware of how the spending is getting out of control. We are seeing our services get cut. We are seeing our infrastructure crumble. What we need to do is be open and accountable and to let the people understand where the spending is and where we can find deficiencies. I think without cutting our public services and actually increasing our provincial disbursements in order to have the type of infrastructure that we need here in Sudbury. Balancing the budget is truly a, an ideal situation and what we would all like to do. And the Liberals have displayed that that's their plan. But we need somebody here in Sudbury who's going to keep them to that plan. We need someone here in Sudbury who's going to explain to the people in Sudbury in truth and fact to let them know exactly what's going on and where the spending is and where we can have those efficiencies. I think talking about a budget and talking about a balancing the budget holds no weight if there's no trust in the person that's giving you that information. So our plan, my plan, is to make sure that we get our fair share here in Sudbury and that the spending isn't going south. And that's the plan that we're going to bring together as Sudburyans and as an independent. I don't have to worry about delivering a detailed message or a lettering message. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Olivier. <laughs> Ms. Thank you. Thank you. Did you say Peroni, Jeff? Yes. Okay, sorry, thank you. Um, I think all of us were raised at a time, or a lot of us were raised at a time where when we're in debt, the first thing you have to do is stop spending. And I think that's truly what this government needs to do is stop spending. They're spending addicts. And by spending $101 billion to save two seats in a general election, I'm sure it doesn't sit very well with any of you there. Spending a billion dollars on, on e-health, uh, just another boondoggle, is not sitting well with any of you. Again, I'm relatively sure. We need to stop this silliness of paying Quebec and the states to take our excess power. Because folks, that's what we're doing. We're paying them to take our access power. That silliness needs to stop. We have created, not we, the Liberals over the last 10, 11 years, and by the way, there are a couple of Liberals at this table. Um, the Liberals have, over the last 10, 11 years, bloated our government by over 300,000 positions. 300,000. This silliness really and truly needs to stop. But first and foremost, we need to stop the spending and we need to stop the waste. Thank you, Mr. According to the Department of Finance, the NDP government has had a, an amazing track record of balanced budgets. But when we look at the balancing the budget, you know, corporate tax itself, the giveaways don't create jobs. And the Liberal government for the last 10 years has wasted billions of dollars. Uh, broken promises, you know, it's, whether it's the P3s, one billion in gas, plant scandals, I mean it was scandal after scandal. We need to start looking at our small to medium-sized businesses. I believe the natural talent and the creativity and the innovative thinkers are in our community. I believe in small business, absolutely. And I believe our city does as well. It's the waste. We are now paying as a province and as a city for these decisions. And, um, and, and that's what the taxpayers are doing. We're having to shortfall and pull right now that the Liberals are, you know, they're slashing 6% of almost every ministry. How do we save the programs? I've met with, I think, just about every sector in the last couple of weeks, from healthcare to childcare to small business owners. Human life is at risk, I believe. 
I think there's a lot of people that are at risk in terms of some of the decisions that are being done right now, and now we got to pay the price for it. Thank you, Mr. Shabanquit. Mr. Picanzi. Folks, let's keep things here in perspective. This isn't a general election, and whoever you uh, gets elected from this table isn't going to be forming a government. What you're electing is a, a representative for the provincial parliament, and the one that you elect should be the one that you feel is going to best express your interest, no matter what the issue is. Now, to ask such a question would be well and fine in a general election and you're asking members, uh, or asking the government what they're going to do, or a potential government what they're going to do. But to ask that as somebody who is just simply a, a member of provincial legislature, it's more than is necessary at this point. What you need, the government's been determined. We've got a liberal government, that's it. No matter who you elect, it will still be a liberal government. So what you're electing is an elected representative to speak to the interest on the issue that you're speaking about or any other issue, not just the debt. And as a matter of fact, the debt does have to be addressed. There's no question about it. And as an elected representative, I would speak to that for the benefit of Sudburyans. Thank you, Mr. Pekonzi. Mr. Chanel. <clears throat> Well, 10 billion out of 260 billion is only 4%. Let's go back to the good old days of Pierre Trudeau with 22% in the 80s when I was picketing the Bank of Canada every Thursday. The bankers are crooks sign. How many of you people remember your parents moving out with a lot of crying? Millions got evicted at 22% interest rates. What happens if interest rates go back to Pierre Trudeau's 22% from 4? It ain't 10 billion, it's 50 billion. Then you're going to hear the screaming instead of just 10. And what if Justin gets in and beats his dad and gives us 25%? Worse. None of them want to do anything about it. Now, let's, that's the software that runs the time bank. How do I get 20 nominators to nominate me for parliament in a half an hour or an hour off the street? I say, I want to be a candidate in the election and I want to talk to them about the let's, which allows unemployed and poor single parents to log on what nights are free to babysit and double duty babysit each other's kids and pay each other with one hour bills even if they're broke. Get a night off, maybe less suicides. Okay, where do I sign? That's how fast I can get nominators. I probably end up with more nominators than I get voters because they hear the pitch directly. Well, I want you to be able to go to the Bank of Canada, log on to the Bank of Canada computer, borrow Bank of Canada new chips from the Let's program, pay all your mortgages and interest bearing debts, and after that all payments go against principal, someday you're out of debt. Thank you, Mr. Tremel. Mr. Odette. Thank you, Mr. Perry, on the Ontario debt. Like I said, the problem is, is really is the debt light load seems to be on the working poor. I believe the major problem in today's society are that the rich multinational industrial commercial and business corporations are not paying their fair share in taxes because of tax avoidance, tax cuts, tax subsidies, grants and allocations provided to them by our provincial government. Billions of tax dollars have been lost to these corporations at the top 1% instead of being used for our social program and the benefits of the poor and the middle class in Ontario. I would tell people to please read the paper by the Columbia economic professor, Joseph Stiglitz, New Plan Overhaul the Current Tax System. And this would probably alleviate prop, uh, some of our tax tax problems and debt problems so we can help out our social and our health care, our education, transportation and other things that we really need here in Ontario. Thank you, Mr. Odette. <coughs> Mr. Waddell. Thank you. I think it's easy to start off with $260 billion and lead yourself into a laundry list. Locally, I think 
what I have heard is that people are interested in pensions. They're interested in a transparent negotiation of public pensions and a new deal for Ontario taxpayers in that regard. Sudburyans recognize that with downloading in a $12 billion current deficit, that there are probably approximately a lot of 100,000 middle managers in an attrition position. What that means for frontline workers, we have many examples around the city. Sudbury Secondary School, new parking lot, still doing the driveway with a snow shovel. No snow blowers there for the hourlies that are doing the work. Prison overcrowding. You say, how, how, how can it be connected to the deficit? How many people have been down to Cecil Facer or seen how many people are going to and from Cecil Facer? We have examples all over the city of mistakes from centralized Toronto planning that haven't suited the mark. It's not, a laundry, it's not a laundry list. It can be a dartboard that can be refined. And with an independent candidate, a younger person than myself, please, we can send a message to Toronto. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Waddell. Mr. Popescu. Uh, sin is expensive. Uh, godliness uh, exalts a nation or a province or a family or an individual. But because of the way Southern Ontario voted uh, uh, for what God calls abominable sin in leadership, we should separate ourselves being in the North. We didn't vote for that kind of a leader. We voted for Glenn as an NDP because we, res we respected the man. But now this lady made some kind of a deal with a, a, a good man. Stay on, Mr. Professor, if you get that. Okay. Answer the okay. question if you're going to speak, please. I'll get, Otherwise, I'll get, a, little, I'll get, get a little more specific about um, the effects of uh, sin in our lives. No, that's not the question, Mr. Professor. No, no, the question no, is about the, uh, about the provincial debt. Do you yeah. wish to answer the question or not? Well, um, as, as a province, um, the NDP uh, un undid the Lord's day. If you, Thank you, Mr. Protestant. If you Protestant. steal from God, he'll rob you blind. And that's what's happening. Okay. Uh, we're going to move on now to the debate stage. So uh, we have a five minute debate amongst the candidates on the question of the provincial debt. You're invited to question each other or challenge each other's viewpoint on this topic. And uh, as I indicated earlier, you don't need to seek permission of the chair, but would, is there someone who would like to speak first? Is this on? One of the things that we've got to do to cut that debt is we've got to stop throwing money at totally wasteful projects, and one of those is the Maley Drive extension. It, I've done the cost-benefit analysis. There are negligible benefits. The benefits go to valet, so we're going to ship about $20 million out of the country, and we're going to take on 25 to 35 million dollars in debt in the city. I disagree with what you completely. I disagree with you completely. I have spent far too much time in Toronto when they get, did not get ahead of the gridlock that they are now facing. People are living their lives in vehicles on roadways in Toronto because they didn't think ahead of the problem. We need to stop this because we all see how the Kingsway is building up, how LaSalle is building up, Notre Dame, Mary down Falconbridge Road. Let's be uh, proactive, let's get ahead of this problem, and let's get uh, the extension to mainly the right done now. We're not talking roads, we're talking debt. How do you pay 11 when you only borrow 10, and they only print 10? So if, if we're wanting to get back to what the question was, which was on balancing the budget, so here's... He's going to get the 11th. So here, here's, here's what's been said. So we had... Our, our progressive conservative candidates say that we're spending too much, that we're, we're spendthrifts. Then we, have the, NDP can, then we have the um, then we have the NDP candidates saying that we're slashing spending. So let me actually clarify and tell you some facts. The fact is that we're actually going to balance the budget by 2017-2018, but we're not going to do it on the back. Hey, Mr. People, are you an orange Tory? We shattered in the past. 
You've had 12 years to balance the budget. We drive by it every day on Bridger Street, a hot 12 years. That's what we have said on this reasonable opportunity to discuss trade offs and waivers that are in and whether a daily drive has gone further and further away from God each direction. You get back to the all right, I think uh, <laughs> the moderator has uh, uh, relied on uh, the uh, the candidates to at least uh, be respectful in allowing uh, each other to speak and state their opinion in the debate. When I say that you can interrupt and uh, and and engage each other, it doesn't mean speaking over uh, each other all together in a big hubbub. Yeah, so I ask okay. that you uh, uh, that we'll try that again, and we'll continue with the debate for the remaining five minutes. But to the extent that. Uh, there's just a morass of people speaking. I'm going to have to change the rules and have uh, people uh, be recognized by the moderator. Thank you. If I may make my second point, since I said my first point. Please pre uh, proceed, Dr. Robinson, and then we'll hear from Mr. Perconti. The other way you deal with it is you have a strategy for economic development, for growth. And the, the strategy for growth that we contribute to the federal government, or the provincial government, is we capture the world market for mining supply and services. That's a strategy that deals with the deficit in a direct way and gives us some growth. And that's a strategy we should be pursuing. That's only one thank strategy. You, thank you, Mr. Picanti. That's only one strategy. So we, we have other challenges and uh, industry and sectors in our, the city. The the chair, the the moderator has recognized uh, Mr. Picanti. Uh, we will give you an opportunity to speak, Mr. Chair. With all due respect to the chamber, and with it in mind with the dilemma of our, our uh, Prime Minister. Now, people plan their economy by listening to economists. Now, that's only, an, uh, that, that's only a, an idea. There's nothing concrete any time you listen to an econ economist. They've got uh, good references, they've got good ideas, good goals. But if you want to know what you've had and what you've got, you have to listen to an accountant. All right, thank you, Mr. Picanzi, for that. Bishop um, well, Bachman. Well, well, for the last 10 years, again, of course, we've had the Liberal government, you know, break promises. We've seen it over and over again, and I mentioned it when I opened up uh, this evening. We have a huge deficit, and these are decisions that have been made by the Liberal government. And this is something, and you know, coming into Sudbury here and trying to, you know, point and tell us how to do and create our own economy here is not the answer. I think we need to be looking at our small entrepreneurs, and they're going to continue to cut. We have daycares that are going to be cut soon. Uh, that has nothing to do with investing in human capital in our city. Thank you, Mr. Bonquit. I think uh, Mr. Waddell wished to speak. Yeah. In, in terms of fair trade-offs and having foresight. Is it the Maley Drive, which has been discussed for 20, 25 years, or is it some form of health care facilities in the Valley and Valley East 10 years from now? Because that's how long it takes to build a medical center or to plan one. Thank you, candidates. That is yes. time for the, uh, the open part of the debate. You'll certainly have another opportunity to chime in uh, in response to the next question, which will come from Ms. Wernbeckel. Good evening. The question is, the business community is concerned with delays in the progress of the Ring of Fire. We've been hearing that while the federal approvals are in place, there have been delays in permitting it at a provincial level. What do you believe are the roadblocks in the development? And if elected, what steps would you take to ensure the important opportunity is not lost for Northerners and the province? The uh, first person to answer this question will be Ms. Shabankwe. A big part of the delay, I believe, is the, I mean, I mean, we had an opportunity when we had uh, Glennis in the federal seat, of course, to be able to get this going, right? This has been a while. The 
part of it is the investment, is, is an investment piece and uh, the promise of, you know, a billion dollars for the roads to get the infrastructure up there. Um, there's consultation that needs to take place as well with the First Nations that are in the, uh, the area. And environmental assessment, there's a number of roadblocks and, and we have to do it right. And we believe in doing it right, especially from the New Democrats position is to create those relationships that we need in uh, the First Nations territory. That's their land, and they're going to have to be a part of it every step of the way. Thank you, Ms. Shabankwit. The next answer will be Ms. Perlman. I think for, we've all witnessed this Liberal government sitting on their hands with respect to the Rain of Fire for the last eight years. Um, and I think it's, it's extremely disappointing in light of the fact that we have so many folks and countries right here, uh, and folks and, and, and companies right here in this city who rely on mining supply, mining services. Uh, they're successful all around the world, and yet right here at home, they are struggling. Um, we need to get our act together on this. We need to demand that folks come to the table at least to have the conversation. Um, giving them the option about whether they'd like to come or if and when has very clearly done nothing for us. We have a, a concrete plan um, in our party. Um, Vic Fidelli talks about it often. He's been to the Ring of Fire three or four times. He knows that there's low-lying fruit, that companies are willing to start exporting within the next eight, nine, ten months if we can just get the folks to the table and have the conversation. And no, nobody's, nobody's asking them to do that. So, you know, the Liberals have sat on their, on their hands for the last eight years, while our, um, our families have had to move west and go south to find jobs, and I think it's really disappointing. Thank you, Mr. Rene. Dr. Robinson? The delay is Queen's Park. We would have had roads into the northwest of the province if we'd been running northern Ontario from northern Ontario. The information about those opportunities were there 15 years ago. The fact of the matter is, as my friend Adam Smith said, colonies that don't run themselves don't do well, and colonies that decide their own fortunes <coughs> do well. We happen to be one, started off as a colony of a colony, and we're still a colony. And the only real solution to things like this is the people of Northern Ontario decide how they're gonna do the development themselves. Now I know that doesn't fit, with the conventional view of the NDP or the Liberals or the Conservatives. But that's what we have to change. We need a provincial representative right now who's going to start seriously fighting for bringing power down to Northern Ontario or the people of Northern Ontario. With that, we're going to be able to solve some of these problems. Otherwise, it's going to go on being decided in 13 closets in Queen's Park. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Mr. Thiebaud. This is um, a two-way street because you need two players on this, the province and the federal government. The government that I am hoping to be part of has already established a development corporation for the rate of fire, committing $1 billion for infrastructure investment. The federal government still needs to come to the table. And as the, as the NDP candidate mentioned, I was there for the last few years and I heard from the federal government that they're not interested in investing as quickly as they should in the ring of fire. What they're actually interested in is investing in the oil sands and investing in other types of pipelines to get the oil sands out. And that's why this government is advocating and fighting for Northern Ontario to make sure that we can get this ring of fire going. A billion dollars is sitting there waiting for the federal government to come to the table. And I also had the opportunity of actually visiting the site when Cliffs was going to be the leader, and they showed, they rolled out the plans for the smelter. If that smelter would have went through, every factory from Halifax to Winnipeg would have been firing. And that would have been benefiting the 17,000 jobs that are in this community in the mining supply and services sector and the 17,000 families that come with that. And we can get the same thing. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Mr. Mayor. The big roadblock, and what's happening is 
the companies that are involved, Cliffs or any other of the mining companies, they pay interest. They are interested when the prices of chrome miner are high. When the prices go low, they turn around and want to invest somewhere else. What we need to do is not stop the work, not wait for the federal government to get involved, and continue with the processes to get the project at hand, get the project going. We have to come through the door without animosity, without, uh, you know, backdoor plans, and to get in there and work with the people, and work with the Aboriginal people, and, and get these processes and get the plans going so that when the next private company that comes in, when the chromite prices go back up, things are ready to go. They don't wait and say, well, what have you been doing for the past eight, ten months while we've been waiting here? Now that we're here and ready to invest, we have to wait again and again and again. And it's just terrible. It's, there's enough of it. The processes will be, have to be put into place. The processes have to be talked about and discussed and, and be made so that when the companies come in, like Cliffs again, to, to invest in the project, we're ready to go. We can't just sit on our hands like we have over the past six months since the last election to say, we are going to get this going. No, we have to do it. And they come in with an open mind, and the process will start working. Thank you, Mr. Olivier. Monsieur Odette. The, uh, the thing would be, would be, since this is part of Ontario's future, would be to, to develop a crown corporation, like uh, Quebec did and Manitoba did when they invested in their hydro back in the 70s. To me, we should set up a crown corporation and get up there and develop it. Use our own, our, our own railway system, get up there, develop the system. Like, we don't even have a highway that goes up to James Bay or even Hudson's Bay. Those poor native reservation up there, they've been really abandoned by our federal government. And as the Ontario government, we should step in there and help them out. Also, like I said, there should be a land deal with the natives, in that case, like the Crees did on the Quebec side with the hydro uh, uh, Quebec, like they're a lot better off than the Crees are on the Ontario side. To me, that would probably assure our future. Like, you don't give our future away to the private sector. You keep it for ourselves and you share our wealth with the people of Ontario. Thank you, uh, Mr. Odette. Uh, Mr. Popescu. Uh, again, we ought to forget about um Southern Ontario and just work as uh, our region for uh, mining prosperity and whatever the future holds for developing mineral resources. Uh, God owns the minerals. He created this planet and he sends confusion amongst governors and corporate entities that um, don't worship him as creator. We want a, a an abundant share in the prosperity of God's creation, we better start to uh, encourage our uh, mining officials and employees and all the uh, uh, related uh, companies to open the first page of the Word of God together for one hour, acknowledge Him as Creator and Sustainer and Blesser, or, or he'll, he'll poke holes in their corporate pockets. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Propescu. Uh, Mr. Waddell. Thanks. I don't know. We built uh, Bay Street once, right at the turn of the century. Built House Street twice now. We'll probably have to dig them out of their hole another time. Normont, Eagle uh, Nickel, spoke to the president. And as far as he's concerned, it's a great liberal pivot again when they come around and say that things are going ahead at the Ring of Fire. And you can quote me on this. There are no timelines with the First Nation. There is no resources on the, or there are minimal resources on the First Nation side in, for them to progress as equals in the negotiation. There are 139 outstanding land claims in Ontario, started back in 1976. There have been 11 that have been solved. It's a 20-year timeline. 
Northern Ontarians know, okay, having driven up Highway 69, what, what the Moon River means, okay? And how it takes 40 years for a government that reneged on promises when they promised the moon at the, at, at, during the war to get through to the dynamite factory at Nobel. It takes 40 years to get to, for the government to keep its word. Yep, Northern Ontario, Northern Ontarians know where we're at with the arena fire, and it's not with the liberal publicity machine. Thank you. Very much. First of all, it may sound a little bit unpopular for, for, for the moment. No way, shape, or form should we separate ourselves from the rest of Ontario. We are one province, and we best off to work together as such. Having said that, there has been little or no uh, cooperation between the communities involved. First Nations is, uh, it has been involved, but the municipalities are uh, more or less chomping at the bit for their own slice of the pie, but at the same time they're becoming adverse to the other municipalities. If there could be a cooperation between all the municipalities and, not, and go beyond that in southern Ontario, southern Ontario was known as one of the biggest uh, manufacturing sections in the world. They used to manufacture some very, very uh, first-rate stuff, and it's all been uh, sent offshore. If there's a community, a community interest, a municipal, a municipal interest, and that's brought forward, the provincial government would have no choice but to listen. Because if they have southern Ontario communities siding with northern Ontario communities, you better bet they'll listen. And like I said, Imagine if I'm in the legislature, and I can get it, get it to you. Uh, I, I don't like to be ignored. Thank you, Mr. Pekansi. Uh, Mr. Tremell, 30 seconds, please. 30 seconds? Yes. Hmm. Well, it's a shortage of money again. How would King Henry have done it? King Henry took a stick of wood, he printed 10 pounds of gold on it, split the stick in two. This part was the king's chip with which he said, go pay people to build me a bridge, and this was the stub. And at the end of the year, he counted up how many tallies he spent to build the bridge, and then at tax time, he said, I want this number of tallies back as fast as the bridge depreciated, and they better tally up with the stubs, which is where the word tally comes from. King Henry I ran a government, interest-free, uncounterfeitable money system. We could do. Thank you, Mr. Trinnell. That's four models I've given you so far, and you won't remember any of them. Thank you, Mr. Trinnell. Um, because of time, we want to get to as many uh, uh, questions as possible from the public. We're going to limit the debate now to, uh, to two minutes on the Ring of Fire issues. Uh, is there someone who'd like to start on the Ring of Fire? Ms. Crony. I think it's very clear that for the last eight years, as I've said, nobody has taken a leadership role. I think it's as simple as that. Somebody needs to get all of the partners to the table, show the initiative, pound the fist, and, and, and start the work underway. Nobody, and it's quite apparent, nobody has done that. That's the key part, someone with a backbone and someone that is willing to step forward and take that leadership role and get the job done. We have some other, we have some other comparables with the Ring of Fire, which uh, are nice for subarians. They can make these sort of comparisons, and it relates to you know those that change party. Who's in charge of coordinating things on the other side at the Ring of Fire? His that, name's God. That heartfelt, <laughs> that heartfelt <laughs> former New Democrat, Bob Ray, right? I'd like to say something. He tried to undo God. And I think that, uh, yeah, a big part of this is obviously the relationships that you're going to have to have with uh, a number of the communities there. And trust is going to be a huge issue for them. There's been a lot of broken promises here in the province. And to take the same behavior and etiquette up to those First Nations is not going to happen. It's not going to work. It's going to slow down everything. And with the current Liberal government, with some of the tactics and scandals, they're already being very cautioned with it. It's going to be a long road for our community. Relationships and trust is going to be really important as we move ahead. And we've seen that the Liberals want to be trusted. Mr. Tika. Oh, Mr. Tika. Did you recognize me? 
education. Sorry, <laughs> excellent. Thank you. So, of course, relationships need to be um, worked on. That's part of negotiation. You know what? When you start talking with the First Nations out there, and you look at um, the judge that is working on behalf of the government, progress is being made. The Minister of Northern Development and Mines was just here in Sudbury last week talking about the development that is being made. But really, what we are forgetting here is that the federal government needs to be a player. You need to ensure that you have both levels of government in this. This is an investment in our communities for the North for the next few generations. Thank if you, it's Mr. not done Tebow. right, we're Thank actually going to be in big trouble, especially in mining-based companies like the communities like ours. Mr. Tebow, 20 seconds. What timeline, what timeline related to the ring of fire in the first... Mr. Waddell, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I've recognized... I've recognized Mr. Olivier. To me, zero. Diverting the attention to the federal government is just a deflection. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't keep diverting it to the federal government. So, instead of doing that, let's take that first part and develop those relationships. And the problem is, as soon as you come in wearing a party color, the animosity stops right there. It, 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 they're just going to not let you into the door. You've got to get in there with no hidden agendas and go in to get the job done and make those relationships count. Thank you. They're not going to develop those relationships if you have an hidden agenda and you're wearing a color and the only thing you're looking at is working on your party. Thank you, Mr. Olivier. Sorry to be uh, difficult with the candidates, but we do have a, a tight time frame, and I'd like to move on to the uh, third question, uh, Mr. Mr. Drew. The Nord of Ontario is souvent pris with des politiques and legislation that ne not pas les besoins uniques de notre région. Si vous êtes élu, que ferez-vous pour assurer que ce body aurait une voix forte au Parlement? Northern Ontario is frequently met with policy and legislation that does not meet the unique needs of our region. If elected, what would you do to ensure Sudbury has a strong voice in Parliament? All right, uh, we're going to have one minute answers, candidates, uh, to, to this question, uh, starting with Mr. Olivier. Merci beaucoup. Pour la question que vous avez demandé, on a besoin de quelqu'un uh, au Parlement, qui est part, qui va être le voix des personnes de Sudbury. À chaque tour, on a besoin de quelqu'un qui va parler de les issues et les, et les uh, sujets qu'on a besoin ici à Sudbury, et pas des sujets d'un parti politique. On a vu uh, tant en temps encore que chaque individuel qui est un parti d'un parti, Il ne parle pas des de euh, issues de Sudbury, il parle des de issues de Paris. Et pour moi, ça ne fonctionne pas comme ça. On a besoin d'avoir quelqu'un qui va dire, écoutez, écoutez nous autres ici à Sudbury, écoutez à nos issues, et dites-nous pas qu'est-ce qu'on devrait avoir ici à Sudbury, on va vous dire qu'on a besoin ici. I bring everything I got. <laughs> <laughs> I bring me, I bring authenticity, I bring integrity, I bring honesty and a new political culture that we need at that level. I believe we're a great city and I think we have a lot of uh, innovation to do yet. And I believe in the natural talent. I think we have some great stories and a new story to tell at Queen's Park. I have a very different approach, a new lens, and I want to bring that on behalf of our city. And uh, yeah, change the way we do things. Pour moi, c'est euh, les gens, c'est très important. Pour les gens qui parlent français aussi, parce que toute toute la ville de Sudbury, dans cette ville, il y a 40% des gens qui parlent français partout. Et pour moi. Je travaille avec les partenaires et dans le secteur um, parce que il y a un besoin pour une université de francophones à Sudbury. Il y a un besoin de, de centre pour les personnes de âgées. Mais pour moi, je travaille fort pour les gens et 
je travaille avec les gens qui parlent français ou anglais aussi. Merci. Thank you. I'm allowed to talk about this issue, so I'm going to talk fast. Um, I've already proven that politics needs to be done very differently. And several years ago, when the Liberals decimated the uh, horse harness racing um, industry around Ontario, I took it upon myself, even though I was not an MPP, to hold a rally in their honour out uh, towards Sudbury Downs. When I did so, uh, after a couple of phone calls, the next call I made was to Franz Gillina because she also had constituents that this affected greatly. I invited her to share the stage with me at my event. She couldn't be there, but she did trust me to read her remarks and her speech, and I was honored to do that. That's the way politics needs to be done. We, uh, our party is the official opposition, and when I represent you as MPP, I am the one that will have the time in the House to hold the Liberals' feet to the fire because nobody has been doing it from the NDP party. And I assure you, as I said initially, I am not a wallflower. The Liberals have had enough time on their hands. And Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you. Dr. Robinson? There's probably 20 people in this room that I want to recruit to the team that would be putting pressure on Queen's Park. Sudbury's had tremendous success in getting projects it needs, but it only does it when we pull the people in the community together and we work out a strategy for bringing pressure on Queen's Park and the federal government from all sides. We're good at it. And that's the way we'll do it for the rest of the issues that we're facing over the next five years. We need to do that for for the Ring of Fire, for example. We haven't done it. We need to do it for a school of creative and performing arts. We have an opportunity for us. We haven't done it yet. But we've got things that we can get fast when we work together. And that's the strategy. Thank you, uh, Dr. Robinson. Monsieur Odette. Comme Franck Bautanien, je te demanderai au gouvernement libéral de Mme Wynne de respecter mes services en français dans les, les, les régions bilingues du règlement 8, comme dans Sudbury. Nous, comme Franck Bautanien, on n'est pas traités comme les Anglo-Québécois. Eux autres, ils ont plus de droits comme nous autres. Nous sommes plus de 40% dans cette région ici. Puis, on n'a pas presque de droits. Moi, j'ai déjà été à M. Euh, Glenn Pibault quand il était... Euh, euh, membre du Parlement fédéral, ce qu'il qu'ils pouvaient me dire, c'est « move on ». Moi, là, je n'accepte pas ça. Moi, là, je demande mes services en français, même au provincial, au municipal, puis au fédéral. Moi, je veux être servi en français comme les anglo-québécois. Moi, je veux avoir mes services en français du secteur privé, puis même du secteur public. Moi, je veux que la ville de Sudbury, puis même la région de Sudbury, devienne bilingue. S'il vous plaît. Merci, M. Lodette. M. Picanti. Would you mind uh, asking the members repeating the question in the English of it? I don't speak French. The question was, Northern Ontario is frequently met with policy and legislation that does not meet the unique needs of our region. If elected, what would you do, what would you do to ensure Sudbury has a strong voice in uh, our legislature? Tenacity and zingers. <laughs> and I'm most definitely not a wallflower. To bring attention to the issues of the day, or the issues that are important to um, the, the constituents of Sudbury. It doesn't just involve sitting in the legislature or being part of the government. There is a whole host of approaches that can be taken. Organization within the city, organization in, in Toronto, uh, public, public statements, a whole array is available. Now, if I have to, I can make myself heard. But uh, thankfully, I don't have to write up. Thank you, Mr. Pekanzi. Uh, Mr. Popescu. Um, again, I think we should just let Queen's Park go right down the drain. We ought to get off that Titanic and open our own Bibles and start to worship God. Uh, he'll prosper uh, your individual needs. He knit you together in your mother's womb, and uh, he controls all the uh, financial issues and uh, health issues. 
that uh, sin uh, has ravaged. Uh, if, uh, we want to show some kind of leadership in pros particular prosperity, we better make it godliness. We better get back to the Word of God. Thank you, Mr. Pefescu. Uh, Mr. Turnell? Une voix forte, c'est pas assez. Ça prend un cerveau fort avec des bonnes idées. Right? <laughs> a good, strong voice ain't enough. You need a brain to go with it. So, now, excuse my stentorian voice. You know, I'm bringing a strong voice with me, but it isn't what counts. Unfortunately, the reporters are offended, keep accusing me of shouting and bad-mouthing me. But I like adding a bit of emotion and loudness. Doesn't hurt anybody. So oui, j'ai le voix fort, j'ai la le cerveau fort, grade 17 in science, 100% in physics, A in fourth year electrical engineering. Anybody beat that? I'm the only science graduate on this table. The others are all low tech. That's why they might have strong voices, but no strong brain. <laughs> I'm glad John brought us around to that resume point because I like to think I have the best resume, but I'll, I'll be the worst politician. Uh, I don't think anyone questions anyone at the table's uh, forthrightness with respect to representing separate. Whether they are offering the type of change that we need, I think, is another question. We're seeing generational change throughout the North. You see a new mayor, young guy up in Timmins. You see lots of change in Elliott Lake. Same thing in Sault Ste. Marie. You have no ripples in North Bay because they manage things. They're transparent. They turn a dividend over from their hydro to people. So it's not a resume, and it's not who feels most heartfelt about it. It's the opportunity to send a message and say some of the things that you wish to have. And I think that in a government like this, with a majority for the next two years, your best opportunity is through an independent candidate. Thank you, Mr. Waddell. Thank you, candidates, for your comments on this question. We are not going to open up the floor to debate on, on, on this question. I think everyone's had their say we're going to, so we can move right on to the uh, questions from the audience. And uh, for the first question, we're going to go to uh, Ms. Knapp. This is a question for Glenn. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, before you ask the question, I, I'm going to limit debate to, uh, to one minute maximum. I may arbitrarily limit that to 30 seconds, so please try to get in your, your uh, answer quickly to 30 seconds so we can get as uh, many answers in as possible. Sorry, Ms. Matt, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Tebow, as a lifelong liberal, I am so disappointed in the nomination process that preceded this election. How can you convince me? me that I should vote for the Liberal Party in this election when I feel that I need to send a strong message to Queen's Park that this is not how we want our politicians to operate and I feel I can only do that by voting for another party. That's a good question. Thanks for that. So the important thing for people to look at is for the last six years I've represented the city of Sudbury, the people of Sudbury, to the best of my abilities. It would have been easy um, just to stay where I was and not go through what I'm going through in terms of having people question your integrity and everything else. <laughs> and so if they can do that, they can snicker, they can laugh, and that's fine. But you know what I did? Is I put it to the people. We're here right now actually having a democratic vote to ensure that if people don't like what I did, they can vote against. If they are okay with what I've done in the past and recognize that I'm committed to this city, committed to this community, it's where I raise my family. I see this community being a great community. It can be better. We can do more. That's all I ask is that they give me their trust to continue to be their voice down in Queensbury. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Uh, we now have a two-minute debate on this question. Okay, I suspect that there may be some questions from yeah, the candidates. Yeah, no Actually, so you had an option, sir. You had an option. You could have said no. Why would you want to say no to a progressive vision? Why would you want to say no to a
Creeks. Sudbury deserves better than this. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Sunday's got a pet. Mr. Brody. Sunday's got a pet. You had five. You had six years to do that. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Bonquit. Ms. Brody. Okay, Mr. Tebow, you want to bring a pet scanner to this city, but sure. your party's not backing you. That's for damn sure. How many votes have did you miss in Parliament Hill? How many private members' bills did you bring forward when you were in Parliament? You made a big, a lot of noise about gas and the price of gas, but did you ever bother to write a bill that it would enable people to investigate and restrict the games that are being played with respect to price fixing? Did you ever do any of that? Did you actually miss 97 votes in Parliament? Did you actually? How was that representing the people in Sudbury? Thank you, Ms. Brown. So, so here we go with 97 votes. There was actually, I bet you you don't know how many votes there was in Commonwealth Doesn't matter. there. There was 1,070. I actually was there for 831 of them. That actually brings me up around 83% of the vote, which is higher than actually most parties in the House of Commons. So maybe you should do some fact checking. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Olivia. Mr. Olivier. Once an opportunist, oh, always an opportunist. <laughs> <laughs> policy, policy is easy, guys. Policy is easy. Honesty and truthfulness, that's hard. Yeah. I'm sorry, we're out of uh, time on this question. We're going to move on to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> we can do this all night. But there will be another opportunity. Let's get on to making stuff better for you! Yeah. Uh, Thank you. This is for Ms. Shimonka. Your party has spent um, this by-election area tax instead of focusing on issues. Was that your strategy? this by-election airing a tax again, a tax instead of focusing on the issues. Was that your strategy? Absolutely not. I, my strategy is to talk to the people of Sudbury and to meet with people and to hear the concerns. They haven't been listened to for the last 10 years and uh, there's huge impacts that are coming right down to home. We talk about hydro prices, child care we just lost 34 nurses. I mean, those impacts are hitting home. People are struggling. They can't even find a dishwashing job. Like, there's no jobs. That's the issue. All right. Um, are you finished, Mr. Shabani? Yeah, Thank good. you. Uh, a one minute debate on this uh, question. Any questions from uh, the other candidates? So. Sudbury has created a thousand jobs since December, and there's more that can be done. So I kind of disagree with one of the things that you just said in relation to jobs, but of course there's always more that we can do. In terms of the negativity, of course I've been the brunt of it, and I'm fine. I'm a, I'm a man, I can take that, I can understand why people are upset. No, 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 but let's be clear. There, there, are, there are ads on the radio now that are being uh, endorsed by the NDP, being paid for by a small group of the USW. And you know what? I don't I don't actually agree with what the USW are saying because the USW that I know, they raised a million dollars for the United Way. The USW that I know actually has miners for cancer and gives back to our community. The miners that I know are a positive force with our community and that's why I think we've got too much negativity. We should focus on the issues and that's what people are doing. The average person sits down and does the timeline from the point at or a, a, around when a person would come to the epiphany of switching parties without having time, without having time to put it through the local process. Thank you, Mr. Waddell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, candidates. We're going to move on now to the, the next question, uh, Mr. Giroud. Question for Mr. Olivier. Two years have passed. La ville songeait la construction d'un centre de loisirs polyvalent qui pourrait contenir deux patinoires d'hockey. De 
inutilisé par les ouvres de Sainte-Marie. Après avoir regardé le budget provincial, sentez-vous qu'il y a de la place pour du financement pour ce projet? Sinon, est-ce que ceci est quelque chose que vous appuierez dans le futur? Several years ago, the city was contemplating multi-use recreational such centers that would host two, hot, two ice rinks, one to be used by the separate wolves of the OHL. After review of the provincial budget, do you feel there is room for funding assistance for this project? And if not, is this something that you would push for in future years? Uh, one minute, Miss, uh, Monsieur Olivier. Such a good question. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> like most major big projects in Sudbury, we have to look at ourselves to get these things done. Use the PET scanner as an example, but I don't want to talk about that. I think in Sudbury, we deserve to have a convention center. We deserve to have a top-notch uh, sports entertainment center. That's something that we have to partner up with private business, because we wait for government to help us on that, the barn is just going to crumble. I watched the game last night. I went to the hockey game last night. And uh, I, I feel sorry. I feel sorry for the people of Surrey that have to endure sitting in this old barn year after year after year. What we need to do is we've got to partner up with private business that's excited about bringing a convention center. But we've got to make sure that all the proper um, services and all the proper policies are put in place so that we're not getting ravaged away. And we have to get this done. I think it's something that we can get here in Sudbury. Thank you, Mr. Olivier. I have one minute debate on this issue. Ms. Crony? Um, we speak to, to a really exciting time right now, and, and this project is something that I'm wholly uh, supportive of and behind. Um, and kind of married to that is the fact that Sudbury spoke very loud and very clear in the last municipal election uh, and ousted a very ineffective council, probably one of the most ineffective councils we've had in years. Um, so as an MPP, I am really looking forward to working with the new mayor and the new council to get a vision for this city, and this is one perfect example of that project. And then I, at the provincial level, as your MPP, get to facilitate and do everything that I can to move this city forward in the direction um, that this city has built by our new councillors and our new mayor. So thank I'm you. tremendously thank you, uh, excited about that. Thank you, Ms. Brody. Monsieur Odette. Well, my thing is, I don't really like uh, public-private partnerships because the problem is with the private sector is they're there to make money and what they're using is they're going to use the public sector to make money off of uh, off of uh, the public sector. They did that with the 407. So to me, we're not going to get you know, the debt of, uh, in debt our children and our grandchildren over it. Let's just build it for ourselves, use our private our public sector, and just build it for ourselves. Thank you, thank you, Monsieur Uh Miss Nutt, the next question, please. Question for Dr. Robinson. Whoa, whoa, don't we all get a chance to answer? No, we don't, sir. We have a time limited uh, opportunity on each of these questions, and uh, if you put up your hand uh, during the debate session, we'll recognize you. Thank you. Uh, the next question. For Dr. Robinson, which carbon pricing option is better? Carbon fee plus dividend, revenue neutral carbon tax, or cap and trade? Fee and dividend is, is the only what one you that actually has a chance of working, being really <laughs> fast, and being accepted by the public. Uh, the proposal for revenue neutrality, as BC does it, involves lots of fiddling around with the tax system. And while it's approximately the same, it's kind of indirect and has the problem that it can be fiddled and not necessarily favored the low-income part of the population quite as much. Cap and trade is essentially a welfare system for lawyers and people in the financial sector. And it's a way of hiding, hiding that you're going to correct the, tax, the price system by, first of all, letting, giving up all the companies the wrong caps, letting them trade among themselves, and secondly, then selling them carbon allowances so that you appear to be taking the money away from the companies even though they're passing that on to the taxpayers. 
perhaps uh, one minute wasn't quite long enough to deal with all the intricacies of uh, environmental policy. Uh, we have one minute for debate on this uh, subject. Who would like to go first? Uh, Mr. Picanzi, then Mr. Trumel. Uh, to start off with, I probably use up my minute with this. Um, you don't have a minute, just to be quick with your answer, sir. It's one minute for everyone to debate this. Unless John's willing to give me a ride home. <laughs> I, I, I clarified that with him before the debate, Mr. Pocanzi, and he'd be thrilled to drive you home right now. <laughs> no? Are you serious? Yes. No, okay. Any further comments, Mr. Pocanzi, before we move on? I'm sorry? Do you have any further comments on this question? Well, just one. I, I, I haven't heard it come up yet, but uh, infrastructure is uh, incredibly important to this town. And we haven't even begun to get started on Bailey Drive. And here I have, I hear all these wonderful ideas and everything else. How about one of us going out there with a shovel and say, here, it begins now. Thank you, Mr. Bugatti. Mr. Trimmel. Well, I don't care how they tax me. I care how they waste it. One. Two. How did Harold Ballard build Maple Leaf Gardens in the middle of the Great Depression when he had no money? How did he finance it? I was going to tell you, and you could have done it the same way, and now you've got to go look up how Harold Ballard built Maple Leaf Gardens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Money came from the McIntyre mine. He didn't build it. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Bill. Uh, come here, did he? Carly? <laughs> I only heckle when it's about hockey. <laughs> the next question is from Mr. Tito. Pet scanner, is, a, is it a political issue or a health issue dealt with in the limb? And once defined, who should, resume, who should assume responsibility for this important health care resource as we are the cancer, center, cancer care center for Northern Ontario? Mr. Tito, thank you for the question. Um, I believe all the candidates here are in agreement that we need a PET scanner here in Sudbury and in Northeastern Ontario. Uh, you know what? The, the, the important thing for us to recognize is no Northern family should ever have to drive down to Toronto to get the health services that they need. And so that is something that I think is, is, is paramount for all of us, every single one of us that are here. But we need to do two things. First, have a clear understanding if this is a priority for the hospital. The hospital, as I stated, that it isn't a priority for them at the moment, that getting a second MRI is. However, counter to that, we have the grassroots push at, at the community level saying, we want a PET scan. And so it's my job, uh, if I'm elected as MPP, to ensure that the government hears that, that we have two issues that are going forward, and I will actually continue to fight for a PET scan for Sudbury because there's no family that should go down to Toronto to have to get the health care that they need. Thank you, Mr. Chief. We're going to open up uh, the debate for two minutes on this question. I know uh, there's going to be a number of candidates that wish to speak. Uh, Ms. Peroni had her hand up, uh, and then Ms. Shabak. Thank you. Um, my party has supported a PET scanner for years and in actual fact brought a motion to the legislature in 2008, June of 2008, uh, which would have almost ensured that we would have had a PET scanner here today had the NDP party not voted against it, which they did. So they're late to the party. Late, late, late to the party. The Liberals have had 12 years to put a t or 10 years to put a PET scanner in this community. They have not done it. There is no political will. Glenn Tebow might have the will, his party is not supporting him. I am the only candidate sitting at this table who has committed to having a PET scanner here with the support of her party since 2010. And again, I remind you to think about that motion that came to the floor in the legislature in June of 2008 that the NDP voted against. Thank Otherwise, you. Thank you, it would be here. Uh, yeah, just to bring some clarity there, Franz Jana, our MP for Nickel Belt, has been supporting the family and the committee for the last five, six years Franz to get a PET scan here. No, let me finish. And we've also had, uh, you know, uh, Mr. Thibault here in place, he had uh, another six years, uh, if not the Liberal government, ten years to get a PET scanner here. 
It's like four million dollars. It's chump change for liberal government. And we challenged the liberal government a couple of days ago, just recently, to cut a check to finally put this aside and bring uh, the equipment that we need to uh, Northern Ontario. We're the only region, we're the only region in the province that does not have a scanner. Mr. Waddell, and then uh, Dr. Roberts. Nicely motive issue, red meat, something that hangs around because of equalization. I'd like to pivot into uh, my role as a landlord in cigarettes and look at a local solution. I have tenants who smoke. In order to reduce the cost of their cigarettes, they travel to Naughton. I would be looking to negotiate nation to nation if there's an outstanding issue with them, get it out of the way, and ask for some revenue to go towards the PET scanners. Maybe another 25 cents a pack, and all fix the road so that there's a proper end Dr. before Robinson. someone gets Thank killed you. driving in there. Thank you, Mr. Waddell. Dr. Robinson. I really need to say this, but let's summarize the issue quite accurately. We will get a PET scanner here. They're very expensive, the prices are coming down, but right now the problem is that we don't have enough demand that the province is willing to pay for giving its fee schedule that the, pro that the hospital wouldn't go in debt running it. It costs $1,000 to $3,000 per scan, and right now most of the possible uses, we have uses for it, are not covered. So let's, let's wait until we get that worked out, until the demand is up, until the price comes down a bit. Glenn is right. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Excuse me! That's not fair! I came here to provide my answers to the voters, and you have no right Mr. to me. Mr. Mr. Chermel, uh, as I was saying to the panel, I was considering opening up this question for a further minute of debate, but I asked for some decorum. Um, I'd ask for some decorum on the issue. You may have uh, a short response. I'll keep it short. <laughs> I want to finance the PET scan. I want to finance the hospital. I pay all the workers with Maple Leaf hockey tickets. Oh, oh wrong example. That was Maple Leaf Gardens. I pay them with hospital credits. In Japan, for Ryu Kipu, 60% of the population can donate their services to the hospital in exchange for services back. Barter for health care services. Same as hockey tickets. Seven different examples of how local currencies could help. Thank you, Mr. Tremel. Uh, Ms. Pro. It's okay. Apparently, Mr. Tremel has taken the wind out of your sails. Uh, I think I'll close this question and move on to the next question. Uh, uh, Can we ask one question? How much money has somebody alone paid for this machine? We've you paid over $6,000. Through, uh, through the floaters, please, yeah. sir. Um, Mr. Giroud. Yes, sir. Let's get to a bit. Let's get to what we need to do the privatization to maintain the chemin to the consumer. Will you scrap the pri privatization of winter road maintenance created by the PCs? Well, you know, I can see that um, anybody traveling the highways, either from here to Timmins, here to Toronto, it doesn't matter, that road maintenance is not uh, being carried out as it should. The Liberals have had 12 years to, to fix this. It's, they're very unhappy with the policy, they know where they're going, uh, and they have chosen not to. And as a matter of fact, I think uh, we are seeing less service on our roadways now than we ever have. Um, and what we have just found out as well, when these uh, companies are fined for not doing their jobs, um, the money that the, the companies are being fined is not going back into the road services, it's going back into the general coffers. That is wrong. That is absolutely more misspending by the Liberals. Again, why not return that money to the transportation and cleaning of the roads to make them safer so that we're not listening to the accidents that are taking place and the deaths that are taking place on our highways. It is, it is apparent that the Liberals cannot make the changes that need to be made. Thank you, Ms. Peroni. We're going to open up uh, this question uh, for one minute for a debate. Mr. Thiebaud. 42 new pieces of winter maintenance equipment have been bought for the North, eight of them specifically placed here in the Sudbury area. So we are making sure that our roads are safe. The, the families that drive these roads need to know that they're safe and secure. 
And you know what? By ensuring that we've got more pieces of equipment on the road, making sure that there's more inspectors, which have been hired to make sure that the contractors are doing their job, this government is doing what it can. And does there need to be more, to, more done? Of course there does. Right? I drive these highways as well. Every family in here drives these highways. Many of them be driving them home. We need to ensure that they're safe and secure. Thank you, the, Mr. Debo. Uh, Mr. Mr. Olivier. Mr. Olivier. Uh, again, technology is solutions for northern problems. We have to have the voice to bring to Queen's Park to let them know how we have to get this done. We can't just continue fining the companies for not doing the work that they're supposed to be doing. It's ridiculous. We need to bring the solutions to Toronto, and it's apparent that it's not working the way it's going right now. And that's what we can do as an independent. You can get in there, and you can speak to Toronto and say, listen, you're not getting it done. Thank you, Mr. Olivier. Uh, Ms. Chabonquit, I recognize briefly comment. Profit versus safety is what it's all about. Privatization, there's no uh, consistency with the contractors. Um, people are being killed on our roads. And right now, we, I, and I think we should be looking at the classifications of how uh, 401, uh, when we look down south in terms of the, the safety that they have for the plows that they have on the roads, they keep them extremely clean. And we have a very different classification up here in the north. And that's something we absolutely need to look at when we're only clearing one side of the, the highway. Thank you, Ms. Shabakwit. Thank you, panelists. Uh, that is the end of the debate on this question. We're going to move on to the next question from Ms. Knapp. This is a question for Ms. Shabonquit. What can you do to stop the reduction and actually improve social service benefits, for example, glasses, dental, and housing for the working poor, provincial disability clients, and low-income people? Wow, that's a loaded question. <laughs> wow. Come up with more money. <laughs> Well, definitely we need more money, for sure. We're being cut all over. Um, I think we need to sit down. I really do. I think we need to collaborate and come up with some really good solutions around this. This is a, it's a loaded question, and we have a number of social ills, and, and we're challenged with that. I believe we need to collaborate on this. I think we need to put some new thinking around it, because we're impacting human lives daily, and the current government is uh, treating you know, many families, a lot of our families are, are challenged. We can't even make it day to day. This is a huge issue, and it's about human life, and I think in terms of the economic and social lens that we need, we need to start looking at it from a very different framework. The currency should be humanity and human beings. Thank you, Ms. Shabankwit. We're going to open this up to debate for, for one minute. Uh, Mr. Popescu had his uh, hand up first. A brief response, sir. I think the best thing for developing um, human character is uh, encouraging the general public in our area to get back to the Word of God. Uh, that will contradict addiction. It will contradict an um, expensive family breakup. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Popescu. Uh, we get the point on that. I think, uh, Mr. Thibault. So, so what we've seen um, is 114 million dollars to raise social assistance rates for those on Ontario works in the Ontario Ontario Disability Support Program. We've had 810 million dollars over three years invested in developmental services for those individuals that actually need those services. We even have an office opened up here, and this is only the beginning. This is the first part of a six-month mandate. Six months into a four-year mandate. I'm actually very proud of the work that's being done on this because poverty in all of our communities needs to be addressed. We've raised the minimum wage to $11 an hour and it's also indexed to inflation. We're Thank doing you. it, Thank but you, there's more to be done.
At least we have the backbone to say it. You've had 12 years, my friend, to figure out the finances of this community and, and for 12 years, and you have not done it. And you have not done it. Every single Nurses one of being laid off, That's people at MNR are you being laid off, and you are keeping it. Thank you. 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 Thank
je travaille avec les, um, les, uh, les organismes dans la communauté qui, qui travaillent avec les gens qui parlent français, uh, ACFO, AFO. Um, donc je, je parle avec uh, M. Riopel ici pour l'Université uh, franco ontarienne aussi. Um, je travaille avec uh, les groupes um, qui travaillent avec les personnes de AG. Mais pour moi, je parle avec euh, le gouvernement en français, parce que je pratique chaque jour, parce que <rire> c'est très important pour moi pour apprendre le français, parce que 40% des de gens ici parlent français. So, donc, c'est très important pour travailler ensemble avec la communauté française et francophone ici à Sudbury. Merci. Merci, M. Moi, j'en doute que M. Thibault a été prendre des intérêts de nous dans le bon temps. Bien. Moi, là, quand il était député fédéral, là, moi, je n'avais pas mes, mes droits. Moi, je, mes services, là, au, au fédéral, au provincial, puis même au municipal, ils étaient coupés. Quand au Canadien national, moi, je, je l'étais à votre office, puis tu sais que vous pouvez, vous avez euh, une personne là qui s'appelait... Euh, Richard, il y avait la misère à, à, à parler avec moi en français. Ça, là, quand tu as quelqu'un pour qui s'occupe des affaires françaises, là, est donc quelqu'un qui parle français au moins. Pas quelqu'un qui, 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 au moins, qui, qui, a son, euh, qui est, euh, comment on pourrait dire ça, officiellement bilingue. Moi, il va avoir quelqu'un qui est complètement bilingue. Avez-vous compris? Merci. Merci, Monsieur Odette. Anyone else wish to chime in on this point? Sure. See, um, maybe we ought to offer a tax break to the English families who would participate in French Bible study classes. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Professor. <laughs> Those are our questions. Just, just, oh, I, I'm sorry, Ms. Uh, Chabon. Just one uh, comment. Um, I don't speak French. I have a lot of amazing friends that are francophone. And, um, but at this point right now, I didn't understand a word that any of our candidates said. And um, I mean, I would hate to have to speak Ojibwe here and not have anybody understand me. I just find it more respectful <laughs> to speak translated into English if you don't mind. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bonquet. Uh, those are the questions. Thank you very much to the audience for your great questions. It's really helped move this debate along in a productive fashion. And uh, the last item on our agenda is uh, closing remarks from each of the candidates. Uh, as indicated, we'll start in a reverse alphabetical order. And uh, we have one minute for comments. Please, uh, Mr. Waddell. Opportunities. They come along once in a while, and as Sudbarians, perhaps we recognize some of them. We recognize our firsts, of which there are many. I put down our top ten from where I come from. Mining capital of the world. Austin Airways, first privately owned airline in Canada. Sudbury's first uh, snowmobile, the uh, Snowbuck, long before the Bombardier product. Inferior as well. CKSO, first private television station in Canada, first private station in color in Canada. The list goes on. Produced the most number of billionaires per capita in Canada, maybe North America. You can go on to other things, less for Sudbury as well. Political corruption. We're the center of political corruption as a result of Leo Longerville back in the 50s. Come into the 60s, there's a little more, and you come to the 70s, and you're getting a parallel to where we are today in 2015. Thank you, Mr. Waddell. Mr. Trevell. Last two examples, when Russia crashed in the 90s, 750 states and cities issued and paid their employees with bond bucks, bond rubles, and 25,000 corporations issued their own McDonald's rubles, Ford rubles, GM rubles, uncounterfeitable, still illegal, and it worked. Et finalement, pour les créditistes qui écoutent, ce sont des crédits sociaux. 
Je parle des crédits sociaux chaque fois. Ils utilisent des papiers sans intérêt. Des crédits sociaux. C'est ça que j'explique au monde qui ne comprennent jamais, comme ils n'ont jamais compris auparavant non plus. So, for those of you who didn't get it, don't worry. Jesus said you'll be forever hearing without hearing. And seeing without seeing or understanding when it comes to interest on money. Check it out. You gotta go to my website to see my Bible poetry, but it's all there. Jesus said you'd never get it, and guess what? I found he's right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Trinell, for being emphatic in both official languages. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I know one minute uh, passes really quickly, so I'll get uh, right underway. Um, first off, I want to thank everyone for being here again with us tonight and listening to what I hope will serve some inspiring ideas for you. Because we all have Sudbury in our hearts, and we all want to do what's right for our community. And while we may be poking at one another during the debate, the debate, we all have great things to offer. I could go through all of the candidates and take my time saying the great things about Suzanne and David and, and Paula and Andrew, and I'm not skipping over anyone else. But I, honestly, I'm not. <laughs> because you know what? At the end of the day, we all live here. We all work here. We want to make this the best place that we can for our families, for our friends, and for our communities. I see my daughters making sure that they can stay here and get the good paying jobs and not have to leave. I see our families and friends making sure that we can actually get the health care that we need in our own community and be with our families in their times of need. And so that's the Sudbury that I have, that's the vision that I have for this community, and that's what I will deliver for you when I'm your MPP in Queen's Park. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, well, we covered a lot here tonight, um, you know, from hydro bills to health care. There's no question we need to make life more affordable here in Sudbury. We need to create more opportunity, more jobs, and a better future for our children and our families. But when it comes down to it, this election is about deciding who can be trusted to fight for Sudbury. I'm that person. Through my work, I've already helped bring funding, resources, and jobs to Sudbury, and I'm proud to have built a reputation for commitment and principle and integrity. The fact is the Toronto Liberals don't understand these values. After 10 years in government, what's the most notable thing they've brought here to our city? Their scandals. But it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be this way. With your support, I will be your MPP. Our city deserves. Yeah. I've talked to a couple of young women lately who have said to their parents, I'm not giving you grandchildren because the future of this world is so scary because of the lack of action on climate change. I want you to look at the three mainline parties here and know that they have been dragging their feet and resisting action and blocking action it's for not 10 out. years. <laughs> Sorry, I just got and I want to suggest that you've got one real answer to that. Don't waste your vote on a backbencher or a third string cabinet minister, possibly. <laughs> Put a vote where it's going to tell the parties that you're worried too. Because if you vote for any of the mainline candidates, you're saying, let's have more of the same in action. Let's hit that iceberg. Thank you, Dr. Robinson. Climate change is really a red herring. What about real pollution? All the porn that are, <laughs> that are blood sucking. Um, TV stations are broadcasting before the face of God. He sees that. And he's the one who controls the wind and the weather. But um, I just want to say that um, this debate has proven again that politics doesn't have the answer to your personal needs or to our region's needs. You hold the answer in your Bible at home. And if you steal from God in the tithe of your time, in the orderly study of His Word, 
he'll destroy you. He promises to vomit the inhabitants of the land out for sexual perversion. There you have it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Trubescu. Uh, Mr. Brody. <laughs> Folks, this is such an exciting time for us. Uh, I am very proud of the way Sudbury voted in the last municipal election, and I think it's a wonderful opportunity for us once again to choose a fantastic representative to, 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 to represent them at Queen's Park. It's time for us to make our uh, voice is very loud, very clear, and remind the folks, the arrogant folks in the Liberal government, that we don't need to be told what to do up here. We have our own problems, yes we do, but we can also formulate our own solutions. Um, unlike my, my, my friend here, who, uh, to use his quote at the CBC debate, is going to be stuck at Queen's Park, I am going to delight in being there and working on your behalf. That's where the work gets done. Um, I am a different shade of blue. This is a new day for my party. It's an exciting time. I am not a chameleon, I can assure you. Um, and we are going to make history on the by-election February the 5th. Folks, you need to vote for Paula Peroni. You know, it's been a, an intense and a very interesting campaign. Um, I believe that we need to have a, a good, serious thought about who we want to represent Sudbury as FPP. And I think, you know, we've been hearing a lot of issues around policy and platforms, and I, I don't think this by-election is just about that. I think this by-election is about whether, you know, who's going to best represent our city and who can be trusted to have the back of Sabrians at every turn. Who's going to not quit? Or who's ever going to not turn on you? And I've learned a lot of good things and a lot of bad things about politics, I'll tell you. And to me, we need to have someone to represent Sudbury first. First and foremost, not a party, not an agenda, but Sudburyans. And on February 5th, you'll all have a choice to make. And we have, do we choose dirty in politics and Toronto-based decisions, or do we choose accountability, openness, and trustworthiness? Thank you, Mr. Olivier. What we need in today's Canadian society, like here in Ontario, is to replace libertarian capitalism installed by the private sector, also known as big business, with humanitarian socialism also known as incremental capitalism. The example of it don't really the work is the recovery after the Second World War. Millions of people here in Ontario are living in poverty. We have to ask ourselves, because of us in our prevailing attitudes, we here in the Western world, including Ontario, live off a corrupt system called the market system, which is controlled by 1% who have forgotten the world fair and equal. Ontario needs 110,000 plus millionaires to pay their fair share of taxes. So please vote for Johnny Olivet of the People Political Party. Thank you, Mr. Odet. And thank you very much, candidates, for coming and participating in this evening's de debate. In closing, I'd like to thank you for your participation, your candid responses, and the issues that, and the, well, your candid responses to the issues that were raised during the questioning this evening. A special thank you as well to uh, our panelists, Tracy Nutt, Karen Hordovenko, and Danielle Jure. The, the Greater Sudbury Chamber of Commerce urges voters to get out and vote on February 5th. We hope tonight's exercise has assisted you in your decision making with respect to how you, you'll cast your ballot. I had a great time. Thank you for coming. Have a good evening.